Let's go into the cloud then. Okay, open it up. You ready? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So we're still waiting for a few people to come in, guys. Um, so we'll give it a few minutes. Um, perfect time to go stick the kettle on and mix up a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Um, like I say, a few more minutes and we'll, we'll make a start. Okay, so I think we're going to make a start at that. Um, if people join us, they can um, hopefully chime in um, as and when they get here. Um, first of all, welcome to our uh, Wildlife Crime webinar. Uh, I'm Adam Linnett from Cheshire Wildlife Trust, and hopefully on the screen, you can only see the three of us. Um, we've got Martin Varley, who is our Director of Operations here at the Trust. He might disappear in a bit and do some stuff in the background. Um, and we're also joined by Sergeant Rob Simpson of the Rural Crime Team um, from Cheshire Police. Um, don't worry, we can't see you. Um, we can't see you if you're in your pyjamas already. We can't hear the kids in the background. Um, so kind of make yourselves at home, put your feet up, kick back um, and relax. On your screen, depending on whether you're on your phone or whether you're on a laptop, tablet, and um, hopefully you can see a Q&A tab. Um, so there will be a questions and answer session later on. Um, so if you could pop any questions that come up, come to mind as we're going through in there, that's what Martin's going to be doing in the background. He's going to be collating them, and hopefully me and Rob can answer some of those questions. Um, okay, so I think we're good to make a start. Um, so today, to my mind, is about um, bringing each other's um, personal experience, knowledge um, together so we can all act as one team for our wildlife. Um, there's no doubting that this is a very emotive subject. It's something um, that I feel very passionately about. Um, the hard work that me and my colleagues put in to looking after the wildlife of Cheshire, um, to see that undone by people that persecute that wildlife, that kill that wildlife illegally, um, is absolutely heartbreaking. It is a really emotive subject for us here at the Trust, um, as it is for you guys at home. Um, but I think for tonight, what we need to do is kind of put that emotion to one side, um, be here to educate ourselves, um, to make use of Rob and his knowledge uh, and see how we can all come together um, to help to end uh, the illegal persecution of wildlife um, in Cheshire as well as uh, further afield in the country. Um, so I think um, the next bit I'm going to hand over to Rob um, who's going to give a bit of an introduction to the Royal Crime Team. Um, so ready when you are Rob. Thank you, Adam. Um, hello, everyone at home who's taken the time to tune in. Um, some of you, um, I'm led to believe, having looked at some of the comments, uh, already have met me, so that's quite good that some of the people that follow us on our social media. And if you don't, obviously, we're on there as a Cheshire Rural Crime Team. So the first bit is just going to talk a bit about the team, basically, and, and why we, we've come into fruition, and a bit of the makeup of the team as well, and how, how we're sort of based, well, where we're based out of, and so on. So, um, our police crime commissioner, he conducted or he put together his, his you know, policies in terms of how he wanted to look at as we move forward, how we deal with rural crime and wildlife crime and some other topics as well. And one of the things that came out of that was this desire to create a rural crime team. So fortunately, that happened in about October last year. Um, we're now in another fortunate situation in the fact that our chief constable for Cheshire is now the head of all sort of rural policing for the entire country. So that really puts us in a strong position when it comes to um, being able to move things forward and get the kind of support that we need uh, when we're dealing with these sort of things. Um, the team 
It's made up of uh, 11 of us, and that's myself as a sergeant. And then we've got six police constables on that, uh, one detective constable. And then we've got three PCSOs as well, the police community support officers. And I suppose in a way that's, it's really good to have the different sort of skill sets on the team because our three PCSOs really give us that angle of being able to get out there and push the messages. Um, whether that's when we did Operation Owl, which was to do with the um, persecution of raptors, um, a national one. We've got the detective constable on there for our sort of more complicated and uh, uh, challenging investigations where there's, you know, some real, real sort of, you need to get into the, the ribs of it. And then we've got six police officers. Uh, on the team, we've got, I'm just trying to make sure I get this right with my counting now. At the moment, we've got four wildlife crime officers. Uh, the rest of them are attending a course later on in the year, which is like a national course uh, run by Lancashire Police. Um, I myself, I've attended that course as well, which is really good because we've got this real mix of knowledge on there. Uh, and one thing that really comes from the rural crime team is that there is this enthusiasm that everyone wants to be on there to actually make a real difference to make sure that you know our, our farming rural communities, our wildlife and that are, are looked after. Um, and having this team since October, don't get me wrong, it's been an absolute massive learning curve because the police let's get it right, don't know absolutely everything. And we have to work with our partners, such as like Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Um, and also, you know, we've worked with other various different groups as well, Environment Agency, um, and a lot of these other RFPCA, RFPB, and so on. Uh, Wirral and Cheshire Badger Group as well. And a lot of these other agencies bring something that we can't. Sometimes it's the other prosecutions, uh, and sometimes it's just purely specialist knowledge. Uh, because I think it's fair to say when we've all joined the police, uh, we, we go to our police training college or whatever, and we learn very specific things about taking a motor vehicle without consent. What we don't learn about at that point in our careers is about whether or not a deer is being shot out of season or which animals are particularly protected and so on and so forth. That comes a lot down the line, as it were. So the rural crime team, it, was, it started out there as looking at trying to build the confidence back because um, confidence in rural policing had waned. Uh, understandably, there have been many years in the past where uh, people were concerned about that there's no presence in the countryside. So we need to do something about that. And now we're in a fortunate position where we link in with 26 rural-based PCSOs. So they don't form part of my team, but we sort of feed into them and they feed into us uh, because they're out on your local areas right across Cheshire. And something you can do from this is if you go online after this and look for your um, local policing area, either on Twitter or Facebook, you'll find out who your local PCSO is for your rural area as well. And that's really good to follow them. Uh, and like I said, they link in with us as well. So what does the rural crime team deal with? Well, rural rural crime, um, pretty obvious one there. Uh, that can be anything from the theft of plant machinery. So it'd be um, stolen quad bikes, stolen tractors, stolen trailers, and so on. Uh, we've also got heritage crime uh, on us. And we obviously did those warrants quite recently as well in relation to that. A lot of the things that we find with the heritage crime, again, happens in the countryside. So you might find yourself out and about and you might be near somewhere um, which is a, a particular historical significance, and you might see a crime that happens there. We also look after the site stuff as well, and that's a really interesting topic for some of us because, again, it moves into um, such as protected species and, and looking at like importation of ivory and so on. So if we get cases like that involves auction houses and so on, then my team will uh, be involved in those investigations too. And then probably the one that's really the main crux of why we're sort of here tonight is the wildlife crime stuff. And, uh, Adam sort of came to a point there where he said about really emotive subject and it's probably, it's fair to say, is the most emotive subject when it comes to wildlife and I get that completely. Um, and, and on our team, you know, we, we regularly discuss about understanding that sort of the impact in it is and how we can best try and get the, the evidence from people where it doesn't get clouded with um, sort of the passion um, and we get the actual facts that will help us be able to prosecute people. And I think we'll be we'll talking about that a little bit later, but when we've looked at some of the wildlife cases we've been dealing with, that would be bats. I mean, a recent one, um, we've got um, people build, you know, builders and so on and so forth, where they've either them themselves have reported bats being present when they've gone to undertake work or other people that have um, raised it as a concern and asked for us for a device and we've been able to point them in the right direction. Hair coursing, that obviously we're not got into what would be traditionally known as the, the period of time where that happens uh, because we're only just sort of starting to get into the harvest time. But we are starting to see pockets of that happen in, in different parts of the county and also in our neighbouring counties too. And we're doing a lot of work with our surrounding forces, Derbyshire and Staffordshire, for instance, on, on the east side of the county um, to share sort of information and knowledge about what vehicles are being involved and so on and starting to target the people involved there. Um, 
seen that also the one that was a, a shovel that was left next to a badger set. I think someone picked us up because I think the original one said a spade, but quite <laughs> quite obviously it was recognised as being a shovel there. But that had been left next to a badger set, and alarm bells are ringing there because, as we know, um, badgers are one of the most protected species in the in the UK. Um, so that's another one that we're dealing with there. And then even down to foraging, which we get called about. It's a really, really diverse subject. And it can go from one day the team getting a call about uh, a new housing development that's going on. And we're concerned because A, B, C and D is happening there. Or the next day it can be um, all the way down to um, something which involves uh, nesting birds and just in a hedge between um, two houses. So we have a real kind of um, mixed, we don't know what each day is going to be in. Another topic that we do cover and um, may well come up in today's discussions is um, in relation to hunting as well um, and also what my team does with regards to that. So we are um, we have the responsibility of investigating any um, what would be seen as a hunt kill effectively. Um, so we would look at the circumstances around that and look to see if there was any information to suggest that a prosecution um, is required and we would be um, as a team we would move forward with that as well. So that really gives you an idea of the sort of things we're involved with. Um, and again, as it goes through the year, there's lots of different things come to, um, to fruition because we go through different seasons and different um, activities that take place in the countryside. Uh, and so we'll see the, the, the sort of the focus shift for the team. Uh, and we also see the kind of crimes being reported change as well. Awesome. Um, so you were saying um, earlier to me, Rob, that um, the people on your team um, they're there because they want to be there. They've not just been kind of thrown in a team. They're people with an interest in either they live in a rural community, they're from a background, you know, maybe from uh, a long line of like um, family farmers and things like that. Um, they have an interest, they have a passion, um, not only for the wildlife, but for that kind of more rural way of life. Um, is I just thought that, that might be worth mentioning. So yeah, it's fair, yeah, it's fair to say that when we we did the interview process for the team as well, it was very much about what are you going to bring to this team? Where does your actual enthusiasm lie? And um, we've got a right mixed bag of people that have either got extended family involved in the countryside, um, you know, life as it were, um, or um, they're into their outdoor um, sort of walking, rock climbing, mountaineering, mountain biking. They spend their time outside or they've got an interest or a hobby that involves um, wildlife itself. So we've got real real sort of interests that bring everyone that together for this sort of shared purpose. And obviously we've got some that uh, within the team who are particularly driven to go, you know, really want to sort of look at the hair coursing type sort of things. And we've got people on the team that are very interested in sort of the prevention of other types of poaching. Everyone sort of has that kind of niche or brings that thing into it. And it's really good to work with a team that actually all want to be doing the job as well. Because it's not like, like just um, sort of said there, Adam, it's not been a case of, right, you, you and you, you're all going on a wildlife course and you're going on a rural team and that like that. It didn't happen like that, which is, which is really nice. But certainly me as a supervisor, to know that the team that's around me have all got a real vested interest in trying to make some kind of difference as well. Yeah, and, and it's similar, you know, working at the Trust with people that are passionate about what we do. It, it makes such a, a difference to a work environment, knowing that, the people around you are going out there to try and make a difference. Um, you know, it, it's really heartening. It, it's really motivating as well um, to know you're not uh, plowing a, a lone furrow and that everyone around you is pulling in the same direction as well. It does make a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and again, a lot of them have got sort of no sort of desire or interest to move on. They're not done it as a staging post to think, oh, this is a good thing I'll just do for a short while. I want to go and do something else. Because of, the, because of their interest, they want to stay put, which means that we get the consistency as well. Um, and we've we've seen that with people that you know reporting stuff to us um, who are out and about they're now getting to know who we are they're now getting you know that face to it as well as opposed to um, coming back and having to deal with a different officer or whatever in a different part of the county every time they know that it's going to be funneled through our team now one one thing I do say is we have got wildlife crime officers as well out on divisions so or out on the, the local policing units as well so they can deal with and do sometimes go out to some of these jobs but Ultimately, the idea being is that we funnel a lot of the incidents that get reported, uh, a lot of the crimes and so on through this one team so that we can we can um, see if there's a pattern emerging. If a particular um, suddenly we start seeing there's a pattern of persecution in this area or something like that, it allows us to really be able to um, understand it as opposed to having to go to individual areas and try and say, how many reports have you had of A, B or C? Uh, we all know it's coming through us so we can see it. 
And, you know, so I think that's a, a nice introduction to the, the rural crime team. Um, I must admit that I've definitely seen a, an increased um, police presence in the rural communities as we've been going out um, from site to site. And also the, the communities that we work with have, have commented on it as well. And um, so although you've, you've got quite a small team, you do seem to cover um, quite a lot of ground and, and like I say, a, a wide variety of, of topics there as well. Um, so for the next section, I thought that what we would do is see what our attendees already know about wildlife, but also as we answer each of these questions, it should hopefully build up a picture of the complexities of what the law states for each different um, species or animal group, um, and also the, the complexities of then interpreting that law, um, showing a crime has been committed, and then taking that to court to find a prosecution. Um, so, if I can pull a poll, hopefully. Oh, there we go. I want to do one at a time. Um, so, we'll, we'll answer them one at a time, guys. So, down at the pub, um, question number one. Dave sold the frog to his mate Steve for just 10p. Um, Steve then instantly jumps on that frog and he kills it. Um, who there has broken the law? So, hopefully, you've got a button you can click. Either Dave, Steve, both of them, or no one. If everyone's answered that one. Um, Dave and Steve now do the exact same, but with a grass snake. Um, so who now has broken the law? Is it Dave, Steve, both of them, or none of them? Okay, question number three. Um, Many species can be legally hunted or shot in the UK, um, but which of these species is on the red list, which means that it's had more than 50% population decline in the past 25 years? Is it teal, a mallard, a woodcock, or a snipe? Okay, question number four. If you know you have a summer bat roost in a tree in your garden, are you allowed to fell that tree in the winter? Yes or no? And question five, um, great crested newts are a protected species. So which of these can you legally do to it? Can you destroy their habitat, um, injure or kill them, move them if they are at risk of being injured or none of the above? Question six, um, there are roughly 70 species of butterfly in the UK, but how many of them have a full legal protection? Four, five, six, or seven? And question seven, um, foraging is getting more popular. But which of these can't you take? Is it fungi, flowers, foliage, or firewood? And then question eight. You're walking down a lane in autumn and someone in their field at the side of the road fires a gun, shoots a pheasant out the sky. Um, it falls in the neighbouring field, which he doesn't own. Um, he enters that field to retrieve the bird. But you're a little spooked out by this, so you decide to not continue your walk. Which law has been broken? Is he poaching, trespassing, discharging a firearm near a highway, or all of the above? I'll give you a little longer to answer that one, because it's a slightly longer question. Okay, and number nine, 
Um, what wild birds have some form of legal protection in the UK? Is it birds of prey, owls, migrant species, or all breeding birds? And then uh, last question, housing development is about to bulldoze a field full of common spotted orchids. Uh, before this happens, you dig some up to save them and put them in your garden, and then the field is bulldozed. Who's broken the law? Is it you? Uh, sorry, the developer, you, both of you, or none of you? Okay. So I'll give you a few more, a few more seconds to get the last of those question answers in, and then we'll go through each of them and me and Rob will talk around the answers. Okay, so that's everyone. I'm gonna end that poll there. So I'm going to read through them. Um, so down the pub, Dave sold a frog to his mate Steve for just 10p. And Steve instantly jumped on the frog and killed it. Who broke the law? Now, most of us think that both of them broke the law. In fact, it is only Dave. Um, so with amphibians, such as frogs and toads, um, it's, legal, it's illegal to sell them, advertise them for sale, to trade them. Um, it's illegal to cause injury to animals. But if you jump on it and instantly kill it, because it's not suffered, technically, that isn't against the law. Um, so we were saying, Rob, about the complexities of understanding what the law is. I'm sure if some pe most people saw that happen, they would think that both of them had, had broken the law. Um, but that's not the case. Yeah, and I think absolutely with what you're saying there, that's reflected a lot with a lot of the, the law that we sort of deal with. And, and sometimes, it's be and it's exactly what you just said there people would feel that that's not right it's not just it's not moral or something like that but ultimately we're, we're kind of as wildlife crime officers put in a difficult situation sometimes where we're going back to people and saying completely understand why you're concerned completely understand your feelings in that one but it just isn't a crime and it can be a real bitter pill to swallow if we're saying on one hand like with the frogs there that you or the amphibians where you're saying you can't sell them you can't trade in them but actually killing one outright is completely legal so it, it, it sometimes it can feel a bit nonsensical or whatever but ultimately unfortunately when it comes to the police sometimes we have to say well okay it isn't an offense uh, and like i said that can be that can be quite you know not not something that wants someone wants to hear yeah yeah no i understand that um second question they now do the same with the grass snake um most of you got this right it is now both of them so reptiles in this country um are protected against killing them um whereas some of the common amphibians aren't. Obviously, rare amphibians, great crested newts, fully protected species, um, and it'll be similar with some of our reptile species, such as, I'm trying to think which ones they are now, smooth snake and it's either sand lizard or wall lizard, and I can't decide which one it is. Um, but we've got two fully protected species, which means that you can't disturb them, destroy the habitats and all, all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, I, I thought I'd include those two to show the different levels of protection given to what are two fairly common species in frogs and grass snakes. Now, if we're asking the, the public to keep an eye out for wildlife crime, when it is so mismatched between um, fairly similar species, obviously that makes it quite difficult to understand, doesn't it, Rob, about whether yeah. a crime has or hasn't been committed? Absolutely, and I think it's probably better to urge on the side of caution. So if you'd seen something happen, then please, you know, let us know. But ultimately, just you know, the, the information's out there, so we can quickly check it, or you can quickly check it if you if you've got those concerns. Um, and we'd much rather hear from people that say I've got a concern about, or I've seen this, that we can do something about, as opposed to not knowing about it in the first place or hearing about it too far down the line. Yeah. Um, so question three: Many species can be legally hunted or shot in the UK. Um, but which of these species are on the red list, which means their population has declined by more than 50% in the past 25 years. Um, so it was woodcock, which um, the same amount of you said woodcock as snipe, um, but snipe, mallard and teal are all on um, the, the amber list, which means 25% declines in the past 25 years or so. Um, again, I just kind of wanted to throw that in there to show that 
the law doesn't always um, reflect the conservation concern of species. Um, so woodcock, you know, high conservation concern there. It's definitely something we try to manage some of our wetter woodlands for. Um, but when it comes to the winter time, they can be legally shot in the UK. Um, so again, as, as Rob's saying, we might see that happen and think that there's that needs reporting, but technically a, a crime hasn't been committed there. Um, question four. If you know you have a summer bat roost in a tree in your garden, are you allowed to fell that tree in the winter? And the answer is no. So bats, all species of bats in the UK, fully protected species, which means you can't disturb their habitats, um, which includes, it, you can't disturb their roosts, um, which includes whether it's a summer roost or a winter roost, you can't destroy it out of season. Um, I guess the difficulty with this one, Rob, is proving that that was an active summer roost if somebody fells yeah. that tree in the winter. Absolutely, and, and, and this is where we need to, to help people learn to not just be a reporting person, so you're not just reporting a crime, you're actually a witness or you can provide evidence in it. And I think that, that's really key where we're saying, well, what, what do we know about it? If it's saying it's summer roost, well, how can, you, how can you show me as someone who's never seen it before, never whatever, because I'm going to have to end up potentially presenting this in a court environment, how can you outline it to me and present it the best evidence to show Yes, it's being used. This is the photographs of the location. This is video footage of bats coming to and from. And again, we're very mindful that when we're telling people to get best evidence, we don't want people sticking lenses into anywhere where um, birds or bats are or anything like that. But there are ways of being able to present that evidence and, and get it in such a way that um, hopefully, you know, if it is unfortunate enough that something happens to a tree like that, we're in a position to easily say, yes there is evidence of it being used as a roost as opposed to someone saying i've always known it as a roost for years and we're saying okay well, we're going to put you in a court environment you're going to get cross-examined about that how are you going to prove what you are saying because that's what it comes down to at the end of the day it's about the evidence and what can back up what you're saying about that being a battery so it's really really important that people if you if, for instance now if someone knew that they had a tree at the end of their garden that was being used as a roost my advice to them would be document it now evidence it in use but you've got to keep that evidence going as well so there's no point saying i've got video footage from 10 years ago of it being used as or last year or whatever it's got to be recent intelligent uh, recent evidence sorry so if we're in that situation where you, you're concerned about that document it now it's the same with um uh, nesting birds and so on and so forth get the get the information if you're caring about the wildlife that say you're concerned about some kind of development or whatever then that gives, that gives you the best footing when you come to report it that we can say, okay, great. I mean, ultimately we prefer that nothing was disturbed. Um, and again, there's some, there's some real onus on people not waiting for something to happen to report it to the police. It's, you know, if you can see a developer doing something, then go and have that conversation or go and if you think there's a summer roost or you know there's a summer roost in there or whatever, and a tree surgeon turns up to remove a tree, have that conversation. Because once you've told them, made them aware, then they've got to do certain things to mitigate it. If, if you can't be unwise to watch it get cut down or felled and then report it to the police, because I mean, that, there's no victory for anyone there in terms of anyone getting prosecuted. At the end of the day, what the, the losers there are the bats or the birds in other cases and so on. So it really does count on it. It doesn't mean you have to go in all sort of um, you know, shouting at anyone or anything like that. It's about having that conversation saying, just before you start doing that, are you aware, A, B, C and D? Okay, so question five. Um, great question, it's a fully protected species. Um, which of these can you can legally do? Um, most of you said none of the above. The above, so you can't destroy the habitat, you can't injure or kill them, and you said that you can't move them if they're at risk of being injured. Um, technically, within some reason, that third one, you can move them if they're at risk of being injured. So I want you to imagine you're in your garden, you picked up a heavy plant pot, and underneath there, there's a great crested newt. Um, what you can't do is put that heavy plant pot back on top of that newt and risk squashing it and killing it. Um, what you do is put the plant pot down somewhere, move the newt slightly to one side, put the plant pot back and let the newt find its own way back into that plant pot. But it is within that reason. So um, animal welfare, animal health will trump a lot of these things. So if you think actually that that's going to cause injury or, or death to this, this individual, um, I'm going to have to do something to mitigate that because that's more important than me picking it up and moving it. Um, but it is within that reason, isn't it, Rob? You can't, if you're a developer, think, oh, if I go in there with my JCB, I'm going to squash all those great crested newts. I better pick them up and move them four miles down the road. It's within that reason, isn't it? 
absolutely yeah and, and and certainly it's it's got to be what is considered to be reasonable yeah okay um there are roughly 70 species of butterfly in the uk how many have full protection and um, the correct answer is six um now these are species that tend to be quite rare breeding um species in the uk things like large blues um think large tortoise shells on there as well um and it's also by by full protection it means destroying the habitat destroying somewhere if they're, they're overwintering species. I don't think most of them are as adults. Um, or even capturing them. So I can remember doing butterfly surveys up when I was in Lancashire, and there was a chance we would catch high brown fritillaries. We had to have a license from Natural England um, to say that we were allowed to capture high brown fritillaries so we can keep tracks of their numbers to see how we're managing that site for those butterflies. Um, there is another list, I think, of about 20 to 30 species of some butterflies that have some form of form, uh, legal protection and that will be against things like trading, se um, selling them, those sorts of things. Um, but actually again these tend to be slightly rarer things. So silver study blue which we don't get here in Cheshire but there's just down the road in Tropshire, they're on that list and things like black hair streak I think on that list again further down south than, than we get here. Um, but again thinking about the general public seeing something and thinking that's not quite right how are they ever going to know you can't even capture a, a, a high brown fertility, but you could capture and sell peacock butterflies, red admirals, all those common species. Um, so I think that's quite an interesting one of, if most people don't, don't know these laws exist, um, don't know what, what protection different species have, how are they ever going to report them um, to someone like, like Rob and his team? Mm. And, and we do have some um, brilliant people, tend to be either work in the world of ecology anyway, or have you know some knowledge of that we have there are some in Cheshire we have some phenomenal people who have ended up being witnesses um, for us or reporting stuff who are really the high-end sort of knowledge when it comes to wildlife stuff as well and and, and for us again it's a, a phenomenal opportunity for us to learn from them and I know that obviously the Cheshire Wildlife Trust has ecologists as well and um, people have spent years and years and years learning these kind of details that you, you from a policing point of view we're just not simply going to get to that level of knowing those kind of um, different butterflies and different whatever. So that's where we, we would come to the specialist because we're like, hands up, you, pre, you, know, you can show us this, then we'll do the law bit. So it's, it's good that we can link in with people like that. Yeah. Um, question seven. Uh, foraging is getting more popular, but which of these can't you take? Fungi, flowers, foliage or firewood? Uh, most of you said flowers, but it's actually firewood. Um, so there are four F's, if I, I can remember these correctly, which are fungi, flowers, foliage and fruit um, that you can pick from public land um, or with, with landowner permission. Um, apparently, we were talking, Rob, that's a bit of a grey area that we might not get into completely. Um, but firewood, ten, people try and, and squeeze firewood in there as a fifth, a fifth F that you can pick. Um, but technically, it, it, if you did that, like on one of our nature, it would be classed as theft. Is, is that right, Rob? Yeah, and, and what we are talking about before as well, when um, the, the old sort of definition that police officers are taught, one of the ones that does come up is you can, you can um, pick and pluck, but you can't dig and cut, uh, was the sort of the generic thing that gets the police officers kind of um, one of the things that we have to remember when we first joined, believe it or not, it's taught in the early days. Um, but again, we've, we've seen it, for instance, where people have overstepped that mark. Um, certainly, even within Cheshire, we've had investigations where people have gone to pick um, what would be absolutely fine to pick under, under any circumstance if they weren't using it for commercial gain. Uh, and the problem is you are straying. If you, for instance, if you're, you're, you're watching this and you, you enjoy making um, your jams or whatever at home or your chutneys and stuff like that, if you're going out and you're thinking, I'm going to get this um, from, some, from some land, I'm going to sell it commercially, you're already straying out of what the, the real kind of true um, you know, elements of foraging is all about, you're moving to commercial production. That, that would not put you in good stead with us, unfortunately. Yeah, so we had that in Stockport with a, one of the friends of groups that we were there. They had a community orchard, 150 fruit trees, um, loads of fruit there for the locals to go and pick for them to enjoy. And one individual came in and picked like crate upon crate of um, Bramley cooking apples to go and sell on the, the local car boot store on a Sunday morning. But they picked every single apple pretty much off these three huge Bramley trees, all the windfalls, absolutely everything. And um, they also have people coming in and taking the other apples for cider production, um, again to sell, um, which like I say, starts to, to cross that line 
Uh, and also it's not really in the spirit of those sorts of spaces. You know, community no. orchards are there for everybody. And we had a few individuals coming in and taking them that, that produce for commercial gain. Yeah, and, and again, you know, if there's any foragers watching this, I think it, it's like anything, isn't it? You, you don't strip it completely, um, leave it so other people can either enjoy foraging as well or leave some for the wildlife as well. Because again, you are at the end of the day, and I, I, we've seen it with dandelions as well, not something the police have been particularly interested where people have, you know, talked about mass sort of removal of dandelions from the countryside as well for different syrups and stuff like that. And in fairness, when we all know, um, it's a, a very early food source for our sort of flying friends, our pollinators and so on. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about everything in moderation as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, question eight, I might circle back to question eight because it's a slightly longer question about that person firing the gun. We'll come back to that one. Mm. Um, so question nine, um, what wild birds have some form of legal protection in the UK? Birds of prey, owls, migrants species for all breeding birds. And um, the vast majority of you got that right with all breeding birds. Um, so under the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, it is against the law to disturb any wild breeding bird um, in the UK. Um, so we often get phone calls from people um, similar to the battery sort of thing. Somebody's, the neighbour's trimming the hedge and they know that there's a bird nest in that in the neighbour's hedge. Um, what should they do? And our first thing is sort of go and speak to your neighbour and maybe ask him to stop cutting the hedge. Um, because like Rob said, there's no win if you wait for that person to destroy that nest. Um, and then you've still got to provide all that evidence. It's all got to go to court and they'll probably just get a bit of a fine afterwards, but that bird's nest has still been destroyed. Um, prevention is certainly much better than cure in this case. Um, but alongside all breeding birds, there's the other ones, birds of prey, owls, and some migrant species might be what's known as schedule one birds. Um, and that gives them a much kind of greater protection. Um, so it prevents things like disturbance around the nest, um, prevents even things like people taking photographs close to the nest and preventing them drones. from getting to chicks. Sending up drones. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Which we, we fortunately in Cheshire haven't seen um, much of that kind of activity, but I know in our neighbouring forces we have. And you know, touch wood and all but we've been really successful in Cheshire this year with the, the breeding protected species. Um, and there's some brilliant volunteers that watch and you know keep a, a real watching eye on some of these nests and if any of them are on thank you very much for doing that because absolutely outstanding job and um, we know that in other counties there have been persecution of raptors absolutely uh, and we know about the bigger picture across the country part of like what we're talking about operation owl which is the national one that's run by north yorkshire yeah, make sure i get my yorkshire's right and um, and we're really we are very fortunate in Cheshire that we have so many people that are keeping an eye on the nests um, and some of them in some quite sort of um, unusual locations too. Yeah. Okay, and question 10 was the housing developer is about to bulldoze a field full of common spotted orchids. Um, before this happens, you dig some up and put them in the garden to save them uh, and the field is then bulldozed. Who's broken the law? Is it the developer, yourself, both of you or none of you? Uh, most of you seem to think that it would be both of you but actually common spotted orchids don't have any special legal protection. Um, the only thing that they have protection from is being uprooted um, without the landowner's permission. Now you'd imagine that the developer would be the landowner and therefore would grant themselves permission um, to plow that field over um, and build their houses. But by you going in that field without their permission and digging it up and saving those orchids, technically you'd be the person that would be breaking the law. Um, and like you say, Rob, this is where people get frustrated. Um, yeah. Because people, I've saved that wildlife. I've saved that those common spots for kids. Yeah. I, the, the developers destroyed the rest of them. You should be speaking to them, not me. But it's that it's how the law's worded, isn't it? And and yeah. the and, protections and, given. And, and we we do see it. We've seen it before. With um, with, oh, I've got to be careful what I say now because there's one specific one would identify something completely but we've seen it where people are genuinely caring for either wildlife or or a particular part of a habitat or something like that and they've gone out of their way to do something because they, they were conscious that something else may happen or was going to happen and and we've ended up inadvertently then having to deal with that person which is a really sad really sad because at the end of the is it in the public interest where someone's desperately trying to help um, and they've accidentally strayed into the, the law side. So we're quite fortunate in terms of, we discuss cases. I mean, ultimately, I'm, I'm quite lucky in the sense that I can sort of um, rubber stamp the, the outcome of, of most of the cases that we're, unless we, we do have a, a detective inspector as well on the, who's oversees our 
um, crime bronze sort of stuff. Um, but we, we education's massive because in a situation, let's take that one for example, the education would be more around do you realise what you've done as opposed to um, trying to say, well, here's an easy prosecution or something like that against someone. We, that's just not how it works. Um, and, and so, you know, in that kind of scenario, we, we, we wouldn't suddenly be trying to just say, brilliant, we can easily prosecute you because the plant's now in your garden, we can prove that one. Um, it, it's just, that just wouldn't happen. But you're right, in the sense of who's responsible, sadly, it would be the person trying to do the right, or what they believe yeah. to be the right thing. Yeah, so I'm just going to nip back up to question eight. Um, so you're walking down the lane in autumn, and someone in their field at the side of the road fires a gun, um, shooting the pheasant out of the sky. He then enters the adjoining property that he doesn't own to retrieve the bird, and you don't continue your walk as a result um, of this incident, which law is being broken. Um, so most of you thought trespass. Um, so I used to work on a, a different nature reserve up north in the county, um, where the adjoining bit of the salt marsh, someone, helped, someone had the shooting rights on that for wildfowl. And technically, if they killed the duck and it came over the, land, uh, over the line, landed in our nature reserve, they could come and retrieve um, the duck that they had killed. So it wouldn't be trespass. And um, it wouldn't be poaching because they shot it whilst they were on their land and they have the rights um, to kill a pheasant in autumn um, from October onwards. Um, I, the way I would interpret this is that they have discharged a firearm near a highway, which is an offence if you interrupt or cause a nuisance or cause endangerment to another person which they would have done to you if you stopped your walk and you decided to go home. Um, but you were saying, Rob, that even then, you know, trying to prove that that's the case, um, trying to yeah. do anything with that, it could even then could be quite difficult. So we have different sort of thresholds that we have to meet with evidence and things like that as well, as you can, as you can imagine, um, before we even go to like the Crown Prosecution Service system. And with something like that, where someone's discharging a firearm quite close to a road, Again, it depends whether there's a hedging in the way, whether ultimately, yes, they may well be within the distance that's prescribed in law. But then there is also a, um, an element of, is it in the public interest to run a court case to, 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 to take someone to task for that? Because if you're looking at the rest of the scenario, um, that person has effectively not committed any other offences. Now, if it was a case of um, they were poaching, they were trespassing with a firearm, all that kind of stuff, then yes, it would all come in part of it. And we'd be looking at all it adds weight to the, the whole scenario that, yeah, they're discharging a firearm here. And we do, we do see that. Now, um, with the rest of it, and we, we talked about like taking the, the, the ownership, and we see that with a lot of different wildlife things as well. Whereas sometimes people who put traps out capture um, mm -hmm. uh, like a non-native species of the UK or whatever, and it's then illegal for them to then re-release it into the wild. Um, with the person that's done the shooting, he effectively... Uh, it becomes his property once he's, he's, he's shot that bird. So then, yes, he can go in and, and retrieve said property as well. And, and, and it's these intricacies that, on the face of it, if you were to explain, and I'm sure people probably listening to me talking about it, are like that doesn't make sense or whichever, when you read out the scenarios you have done, you definitely there'll be people that feel very strongly about, well, actually, quite clearly, he's, he's, he should be prosecuted or she should be prosecuted because they've shot near, near a, a highway. And obviously, that's either endangered or caused a nuisance or caused whatever. And um, sadly, if only the law was as straightforward as that in some, in some circumstances. So, yeah, there is, there is some grey area about it. But having said that, we, you know, we will look at it and we will investigate it. And if it comes transcribes that, um, that they have caused that issue, then, yeah, of course, we, we wouldn't just you know snub it at the, uh, the earliest opportunity there has to be some work around it and again it might come to education again but I, I would like to think that those who have got access to um, firearms um, would have some kind of um, um, well they definitely should be having some kind of working knowledge that's not going to affect their their licenses as they move forward. Excellent so you're gonna have to excuse me for a minute because my mouse is frozen on my laptop now i need to go and grab a spare one out of the other room and um, so just give me one second and i'll be straight back in the meantime um we're going to move on to the q a session so if you've got some questions for myself and rob you can find the q a tab type them in there and i'll be back to you in just one second you're going to appear on my screen now frozen So 
Adam, while you're just fixing that uh, mouse yep. problem there, did you did we want to touch on any of the, the sort of the reporting thing? Do you want to do that after the question and answers or? Let's do it now. Let's get out of the way now. Um, so we did shoot some videos, but unfortunately, like my mouse, we're having some technical issues and it's not going to play. Um, hopefully, when we send you out a link um, to this webinar, we'll edit it and put the, the videos on at the end. Um, but we're saying about trying to report these crimes. So if you've gone out in the countryside, you've seen something, you think it's a little bit suspect or definitely illegal, um, obviously you need to pick the phone up, um, ring the police, and then there's going to be some information that you're going to need, isn't it, Rob, to make sure that you get to the right place, you know that what you're looking for and all the rest of it. Is there some help or advice you could give to folks for what they need to do? So absolutely. So in the video scenario, which everyone hopefully will get to see at a later date, um, we looked specifically at a vehicle that was parked up in an entranceway. Now that, that vehicle could be involved in any of the topics that we talked about, like the rural crime, waste crime, um, heritage crime, and the wildlife crime side of stuff. And, and we were saying that basically, who, who better to know what's not right in the countryside around them than the people that are out there either working, uh, you know, living there, playing there, whichever, um, and they're used to it. Maybe it's a regular walk you do and you think, right, why is this suddenly turned up at this location? There's something really not right about it. And what we're saying basically is you're probably right. If there's something in, in your, you feel it in, in here that's saying something's not right about this vehicle, the way it's parked up, um, what's in it, it might have like power tools in there and we're thinking to ourselves, it's the middle of the day or middle of the night, there's no one around, no one stores power tools on the back seat like this if they look after their kit, or there is obvious, um, you know, evidence of like some kind of snares or something, you know, something's just not quite right. Um, and you want to report it to the police as something being suspicious, well, what would you do? And we were saying that basically, what was the information you'd tell us? So you don't get a situation of it just being closed off as um, information or being misreported as just like, um, a generic kind of incident of like antisocial behavior or something like that. sometimes specialist topics can slip into something else because the information isn't given to the core handler in the right way so we were saying that okay you've identified it suspicious but what is it about that's suspicious we need to know about that when you phone 101 or if it's a crime happening there and then so you've seen for instance let's say it was uh, badger baiting or badger digging so there's dogs or there's people with um, spades and things like that there's people there we want to know about it. So that would be a 999 incident, that would be. If there's a crime happening there and then, we want to know about it, we should be deploying to it. Um, if it's a case of you've seen the vehicle, it's parked up, then that would probably fall into the 101 um, call. So the vehicle, if let's say it is the vehicle, what, what are you going to describe to it? Because we might be coming from some, from some distance. It might be a colleague that doesn't work in that particular area. So you want to be able to decide, describe what type of vehicle it is, the colour of it. These are obvious things, like the the registration for instance but we talked about the registration can be changed and unfortunately some of those who move in the criminal circles will change number plates if they're involved in this kind of crime and don't get me I have to be very clear on this a lot of people that are involved in wildlife crime offenses are involved in other crimes as well in urban areas some of them some of our most serious crimes as well um, and i'm not playing down wildlife crime any sense there but some of the people that involved who, who have their um activity at the weekend going out and persecuting badgers for instance they may well be involved in very 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 significant and organized crime uh, the rest of their life so uh, or the rest of the time so it's really a great opportunity that we can try and get them prosecuted for something else as well uh, as well as obviously looking after the wildlife so um we'd want to know about has it got any really obvious dents on it is there any stickers on it anything that's going to really if i'm coming up this country lane in the middle of the night time um can i suddenly spot this vehicle uh, and be able to go after it rather than having to make to the location. So I think in the video we talk about the, the, the vehicle in question has got one of the air, uh, air vent spinners on the roof, just quick things like that. And, but one of the things we would stress is don't put yourself in danger by approaching a vehicle or people or anything like that to try and get more detail. Um, give us the detail if you can get it, but ultimately just um, report what's going on. One of the apps that um, we use now on the team and right across the force and our control room user is what three words. And some of you who are watching this may well use what three words. Uh, if you don't, um, I'm not on retainer for them or anything like that, but I would advise it's an excellent tool. Um, our call handlers can link it straight through to our incidents. And basically it's an app that has, um, someone might correct me, but it's three, it's every three meter square in the whole of the world has a word um, or three words assigned to it. And, what you do is if you get the WhatsApp, uh, what three words, um, and in the video I actually give the three words of the location we're filming, 
but you can type that into your phone and it will come up and show you exactly the car park we did the filming in. But if you're stood next to, let's say, this bat roost, for instance, and you want to say there's a bat roost in this tree um, and it's not nowhere near any roads or anything like that, use the what three words um, on your, you mark it on the, uh, the map where you are, send that through, and we can instantly pinpoint exactly where it is. There's also um, a photo version of what three words done by done by the same company as well, where you can take a photo and it automatically tells us what three words. So if there's any homework for anyone tonight, it's to get what three words on your phone. Uh, there are grid reference ones as well that you could use, but certainly our systems are now linked up to that and our team are using that as well. It's been really successful and so on. So um, when you are phoning it, and then we, when we joke, I joke about on the video, people have, in the past said uh, it's just down the field past the cows on the left and don't please don't use movable objects as a way of being able to identify where things are people do uh, if, we're, if we're not getting there straight away and something's moved it just causes complications and then um, the other thing is if you are phoning in a wildlife crime a rural crime because it may not or a heritage crime whichever please insist on getting an incident management uh, log iml or an incident number because that way I can be happy that it's then gone onto the system. And once it's on our system, our reporting system, it can't be deleted, it can't disappear. So it's always traceable. So you can phone at any time to say, where's this up to? Where's it gone to? Has it gone through to a unit or um, has an officer looked at that? If you don't get given an incident number, then um, it could fall into just an email that just gets sent through to a mailbox and, and things can get lost. So it's really, really important that you get an incident number when it comes to that sort of stuff. Excellent. Uh, I think that what three words one is a, a really good one to have. Um, so, for example, um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, there's currently a, a Lamagaya uh, vulture over in South Yorkshire. There's apparently a two hour walk from the nearest car park. Um, so you can imagine that that two hour walk, people must be covering, I don't know, five miles or more. Um, you're trying to guide somebody like Rob to what might be a pole trap set for birds of prey um, that you've just seen on a fence post literally in the middle of nowhere um very difficult to describe but with what three words you can tell him exactly where that pole trap is um, and somebody can come out and have a look at that um so it's it's brilliant for for rural um incidents isn't it yeah and and the, the other bit is if you were on that walk and you fall over and hurt yourself you can tell us exactly where you are for mountain rescue and um, if you come across a road traffic collision in a really rural location um, i suppose the caveat however is it's technology and relies on signal so again um nothing sort of you know always be able to sort of describe where you are from knowing sort of your good map reading or whichever uh, and the other thing we touched on was um, you may work in an area where you know all the local names so it might have um such and such a spring bank brook or something but it's not on modern maps like that because it's like a local area that you know it's grown up in generations of people living in that village know a particular area is dragon's mound or something just something really obscure isn't on a modern map so when you're telling people where it is don't be drawn into trying to use sort of the, the local stuff really it's about making sure and that's where what three words puts us all on a, a level playing field excellent so i think we're going to delve into these um these questions rob mm. uh, let's start with with what we thought was going to be um the, the hot topic um which is fox hunting okay um so how do people go about helping to um, prevent, um, report, and hopefully bring about a successful prosecution against somebody that is illegally fox hunting, um, either on their land or you know, in the countryside? Okay, so it's quite a wide ranging question in the sense of it saying, what can we do to, to if we believe so when we when we talk about fox hunting and i've got to be really sort of mindful of the language you're using into or well, certainly i'm using so um i'm, I'm going to refer it just as hunting because as we know anyone who's watching this fox hunting is illegal um obviously what what we see being going on in the countryside or what is reported to going on is trail hunting and, and so on um, and obviously people have and it's an incredibly passionate subject and i completely get that about it so rather than getting to the devil's out let's talk about the um what we do now um the the for us from the policing point of view we're obviously present when we can be um if, if there's a report of something going on that's of concern but if you are a member of the public that's observed something it pretty much goes back to what we were just talking about before um and in, in its simplistic terms when we talked about like nesting birds or um the, the bat roost it's about what evidence can you actually provide to say something's happened 
And also, really important thing is um, being able to provide that evidence, not only in a, um, a really sort of usable way, but also being able to stand by your evidence. So historically with wildlife crimes right across the board, sometimes people don't like giving their personal details or going up against like a housing developer or something like that. We need that full stop. If you're going to provide us evidence, you have to be 100% committed with it. You have to be able to put your name to it and you have to be ultimately willing to stand in the courtroom and give your evidence. That's, that's, without that, we, we would fall at the first hurdle. So um, the, obviously with, with, when it comes to um, uh, hunt stuff, um, the, um, if, if you're suspecting something's going on that's illegal, then it would be a case of how you present that to us. What is it that you suspect is illegal? Um, what is it that you can evidence to show that is the case uh, and, and, and that's basically what it falls down to now um, there are with, with the hunting act itself it is a very complicated act I think it's fair to say that that is and you know um, we acknowledge that in the policing point of view we absolutely acknowledge that because hunting in its sense as long as all the um, all the um, rules as were are being adhered to is completely legal um, it's when that when that then strays from that is where we've got the obviously you know, people raise concerns and so on and so forth and, and rightly so if they're seeing something that they believe is illegal we need to know about it so um so really speaking in terms of what can they do it, it's hmm, it is a basically a case of what going back to what i just said there with the evidence side then so if they are out and about in the countryside they witness something of some concern it's then how they then present it to us and then they have to be able to work with the police to be able to move things forward um, ultimately, like I said, we, we do sometimes get the concerns where we think, okay, you provided this, now we need to move it forward. And, and people have said, we don't want to personally, for, and they might outline reasons and, and their reasons um, are their own, but it may well mean that we can't then go on. So for me, the biggest thing is if you have concerns and you want to report them, you have to run with it with us in terms of be committed to, the, to, to what, what we're saying has happened. So like, as I said, we thought this might be a hot topic. So I spent a bit of time reading around um, successful prosecutions, prosecutions that failed. And um, it's, that, it's having that concrete evidence, isn't it, that stands up in court. Um, so there was one case that I looked at where two gentlemen were accused of hunting a, a red deer stag um, on horseback with dogs. Um, and they, under the, the hunting act, they tried to claim that it was a, a mercy killing, that the stag was injured and they were just going to kill it to put it out of its misery, basically. Um, that, defense um, basically wasn't needed because the, the video evidence that was submitted, the judge looked at it and said, yes, a wildlife crime has been committed there, but you can't make out who it is, those two gentlemen on, on those horses. And therefore I can't prosecute the two, two gentlemen before me because there's no one that could definitely say that it was these two blokes on those horses hunting that red deer stag. So even with video evidence, you know, if it, it's got to go in front of a judge and if that judge decides that evidence isn't good enough, the prosecution just doesn't happen. Um, but again, you know, the frustration there for the, the people that saw that happen and, and captured that footage, um, the people anywhere nearby that, that, that love their wildlife, um, the, the rural crime team, the police officers that built that case and gathered that evidence, even the CPS that, you know, wanted to see, took it to court to try and get these people prosecuted. The frustration for, for everyone involved when it all falls down must be, must be immense. But you know that that's that's the way that the the law works isn't it so yeah and across the board when we talk about any of the kind of crimes we investigate even removing it from wildlife and rural and going to any you know no police officer wants to investigate things um like you know investigate a burglary or something like that for it to then get to a court case and for the um for it to the case to fall down but that, no one wants that and that's why it's so critical that um, evidence, evidential wise with any kind of investigation that we're really solid on it and that um, we've got the full support of the people providing the evidence and so on uh, and, and we, we unfortunately with anything we can never guarantee that you a member of the public will get the result that they want or, or, or you know so it is, a, it is a real tricky one and certainly you know a very passionate subject for, for a lot of people um, and, and, and again, it can be one of those where when we are having to have these conversations about where we're up to, what's happened, whatever, um, sometimes the conversation isn't, isn't what people want to hear. And, that, and that, you know, it's, not, it's not pleasant for us to have to deliver uh, unpleasant conversations, as it were. Um, we get no sort of joy from it or anything like that. But sometimes the law is what the law says, and we're, we're, that's how we work. We've got to go guided within it. 
Right, I'm aware that we're already up to our one hour event, so we'll, we'll rattle through, through a, a few more if everyone wants to hold on for a few more minutes. Um, so do you work closely with the Crown Prosecution Service uh, or have a dedicated prosecutor or do wildlife crime prosecutions tend to go through um, organisations such as the RSPCA and the RSPB? Excellent question as well. Um, so we do have in, in every, uh, well, I've got to be careful. I know that in our Crown Prosecution Service, we have dedicated um, like rural wildlife prosecutors. And there's a head one in the UK and various other bits involved. Um, I believe there is one in every single sort of CPS. So ours is Merseyside, Cheshire, for instance. Um, so yeah, we do. And um, I know that for instance, we are due to be having um, another meeting just to see where we're up to and what's required and stuff like that, because it's always to have that sort of healthy relationship there. And then the other side of things is with the RSPCA, for instance, which is a prosecuting body, uh, or even like Natural England, for instance, another prosecuting body, um, when it comes to like SSI sites, sites of special scientific interest and so on. Um, we have a really interesting dialogue about that, because sometimes it might be a case that um, we say, we're we will prosecute that, that's for us. Um, or the RSPCA will say, no, 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 we will we'll run with this as the case and we link in and support. Uh, and again, same with um, uh, Natural England as well. So there's always a discussion that's done about who's the most appropriate to take the action um, and, and who's got the, the sort of the most, um, the right specialist skills, as it were, or the right uh, resources to be able to, to push certain offences as well. Okay, so there's actually quite a few questions about um, the Royal Crime Team and some of the things you do more than there is questions about specific um, wildlife legislation. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you work um, with other counties, such as Derbyshire yes. and Staffordshire. Um, do you also work with North Wales? We do. We have a good relationship with North Wales and West Mercia as well. Okay. Um, and is there any difference or, or obstacles in terms of laws and protections between the two countries, between us and North Wales? Um, not really. I mean, they have, obviously, we've got like uh, the Environment Agency where they've got Natural Resources Wales. I have to remember all my, my different partners that we deal with and so on. But the, um, no, we don't tend to because a lot of the um, the laws across the thing are identical or the same. Yeah. Um, very much sort of on the on the, the North Wales side as well. They're, they're an excellent team over at North Wales in terms of, and if you ever look at their social media, you'll see that the, the work they've done with um, protecting wildlife and so on. Um, so, no, I don't really, I don't think we've come across any real barriers. They're all very good. Um, all the teams that I've ever met are made up of people that want to do the role, um, as opposed to the, you know, like we said before, it's like, oh, Dave, you, you're now doing this. And it's like, what? Um, they are literally all, all got a keen interest. And, and it, when we go away to like the National Wildlife Conference, when we had that um, last year, and you sort of networking and meeting all these people from all around the country have all led some phenomenal projects um, to, you know, and we, we speak to the officers involved with like, um, I keep coming back to Operation Now, but there's an easy example there, um, who've led that and what's behind it, and that is brilliant. So no, locally we work, we soften the borders, so it means that we're not got a case of, we think, we drive towards the border and think, oh, Derbyshire's border's just down there, there's no point going to it, we go over it, um, and uh, vice versa, so that now there's not these corridors for people who are either persecuting the wildlife or committing rural crime to be able to drive down, because no one's stopping at the county line or um, stopping short of it and leaving this piece of land so everyone's crossing over which is brilliant uh, and we're literally speaking to all our sort of different forces that we're neighboring with um, pretty much every other day if not every day sometime. Excellent um, and does the team have to deal with ordinary crime such as um, violence, burglary, you know assaults but just in a more rural setting out in the, the villages um, in more remote places across Cheshire? So another good question the Local policing units still exist in our rural setting. There's 613 square miles of rural Cheshire, um, which obviously there's 11 of us, so we're not re we are responsible for the main hub of all of it. But in terms of the actual um, sort of generic crime that's going on, if we're we're the nearest patrol, we're going. We're still police at the end of the day, so we have responsibilities on top of all the bits I've mentioned for. Uh, mental well-being in rural communities, um, domestic abuse as well. So if we got that phone call, 909 call coming in or whatever, saying you know, I'm, I'm scared because of this reason, we're going to it. And the expectation would be with the nearest patrol, we are going to, you know, and we do, we, we still do a road traffic um, collisions, road traffic enforcement, speeding and all that sort of stuff. Um, we have, we, we go to farm burglaries alongside CID partners um, and various other bits. So yeah, we still, we still, if we're there, we'll deal with it. It's not something that we just say, that's not for us. It's not in our remit. 
that we're cops at the end of the day we've, we've got a responsibility to be there for the public excellent um and we've had a couple of people asking about how they can be more involved so whether there's there's an opportunity to volunteer um yes. and whether um there's somebody here that's done um a wildlife crime internship um obviously wants to see this as a, a possible career path um what's the next kind of step for them okay so in the background i'm working with uh, one of the inspectors at headquarters to start increasing the roles of PSVs, which are police support volunteers. And I know certainly um, you may be watching us today. Um, an ecologist has got in touch who's really interested in getting involved and in I want to bite his hand off absolutely to be able to get involved and have an ecologist on the team. I mean, how phenomenal would that be? Certainly when we're dealing with like planning issues with um, housing estates and stuff like that. But people who've done like the internship, I want, we're, we're looking at PSVs for um, our event stuff, our, wildlife expert stuff our heritage stuff as well because we've got people that are really interested in their uh, the heritage so yes that's coming and that is i've been pushing that now since we've pretty much started the team but unfortunately um pandemic got in the way a little bit and also the slow cogs we're just making sure we get the right job profiles so um what we'd ask is there are police um, service volunteers uh, thing on the website which people can link their kind of interests and say i am interested in joining as psv We've also got um, special constables as well, which I've been really pushing for. And I really love people who've got an interest or live in rural communities to, to get involved as well. Because um, I know, for instance, like last night and tonight, some of my um, rural crime special, uh, special constables have been out and about involved in operations and stuff right across the county. And they're all playing their part. I'm also exploring an idea of another kind of um, volunteer as well. But that's still very early days, um, which is um, not a sort of, um, potential for confrontation as like a special constable for instance and that might suit a lot more people that just genuinely want to get involved at a more sort of lower level but like like the idea of being more embedded with the team so um, there's a few things to watch this space but I'm, I, if, if I had it my way I'd be saying yes right now and I'll absolutely bite people's hands off to get involved but the um, um, it's, a, it's a slow process at the moment so please keep in touch and keep watching the social media for when I can finally say applications open for Excellent. It, it would be really nice to see more people getting involved in this sort of thing because the more eyes there are out there, the more people reporting stuff, the more likely not only are we um, going to find the people that are doing these things, but we're going to prevent them um, from thinking it's, it's worth doing in the first place. Yeah. Um, two more questions. So there's a couple here I'm going to combine together. Um, a person hears some gunshots um, and saw some crows being shot. Um, is there anything that they could have done to check the person had the appropriate gun license or was committing any sort of crime? And there's someone else asking a similar question about um, hearing gunshots year round. Um, how are they going to tell if the, those people are hunting legally or not? Okay, so um, again, it's a tricky one because at one point we and we did get a number of calls about people concerned, especially during the, the sort of the lockdown, if we can use that terminology because uh, more people who were taking their exercise into the countryside and stuff like that. We're seeing um, activities which probably have been happening every single year when, um, you know, crops are being sown or uh, whatever, and um, corvids or other things, or birds are coming down. And it's, that, it really relates to the general license stuff um, about who's got permissions and so on and so forth. Now, the vast majority of time, people are shooting under a general license when they're out, they're out shooting in the field. Um, and they're doing so lawfully uh, with the correct sort of permissions in place and um, and and shooting, how do you say that, shooting the correct birds. Uh, it's not a nicer way of putting that, but birds that they can lawfully shoot, as it were, as opposed to any of the protected species. So for them to know is really difficult. Now, uh, the people that are normally involved in shooting and stuff like that will, um, if, if it's a shotgun, for instance, if, some, if someone's approaching and they should break the firearms. You can always ask that question, but don't go and put yourself in any danger, as it were. That's always my caveat. Don't don't go and uh, confront people um, in a. If certainly, if you know, it defend, might not even know you're there. The last thing you want to be doing is sneaking up on someone who's who's in possession of a firearm to ask them whether they should be there legally. Not because there's any particular risk to you, but the, it's the making someone jump. Uh, not a good idea. And um, so, it is a tricky one. The the. If they know the landowner, they can always ask the question of the landowner at the farm. Do you know there's someone shooting on your land over there? It's so varied. And, and I know we got quite a few calls uh, this time around, all of which um, turned out to be absolutely lawful use of a general license. And I, and I appreciate the general license is up for question at the moment. I know it's just been extended, I think, till 
February time, um, I needed to be sure on that date in its current format. Um, and I know that it's going to be looked at again and so on. So it, it is a tricky one, uh, but we tend to find that the most majority of people that are out using the shooting like that would be doing so under the general license. Now, forgive me, can I just check that I've answered that question or whether I went off on a tangent? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a, a relatively good answer for that that, that question because it's, it's quite difficult, isn't it? Like you say, you, you don't want to, to encourage people to wander across to somebody with a shotgun and say, excuse me, are you doing that, that properly? Um, but at the same time, it's good that people are aware of these things. And, yeah. uh, you know, the, we will, another question we've got is where are these laws? Is there somewhere people can go and read these laws, read the general license, those sorts of things, mm. and what? So in the follow-up email, we'll include those links um, to like the government websites. So you can have a look, have a read. And then if it is that you think people aren't um, following those rules, then that's when you get on the phone and you, and you give the Royal Crime Team a call. And hopefully they'll either tell you, no, that sounds right to us, or actually, you know, you might be right there. We'll come out and we'll have a look. Um, and I, and just, I was going to say, just on that, the, the, we had one instance where it was, again we talk about the true like within the true nature of, of the you know a true spirit or whatever of it and you've got people saying well i'm going to use a general license um to shoot crows for instance in this wooded area over the back of the field and you're saying to yourself okay well it's what time of year is it are there any crops being grown at the moment is there any livestock out and about that might be at risk or depending on what your viewpoints are and um, so that kind of sometimes helps build a picture if there's some concerns because you know people that are using the general licenses will be doing under many of the provisions, which might be protecting uh, wood from damage, which is one of them, um, crops, uh, uh, other you know. So if it's obvious that there are crops that have, you know the, the ground has been drilled and there's definitely oats or seeds being planted, then that, that's a real sort of obvious tell that that gives that reason for the general license being used, for instance. But if it's in the middle of starkest winter, and I appreciate there are winter crops as well, um, but you know, it's that kind of thing. So it's just about making sure you're you're comfortable with what you're observing and what you're reporting to the police. Excellent. Uh, and the final question was actually about something I said about a pole trap. Um, now, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong here, Rob, but a, a pole trap is normally set on, on top of a, a fence post. Um, it's a spring-loaded trap. And the idea is that you bait it and a bird of prey comes along, lands in that trap, and that spring um, triggers, clamps on the bird's legs, and it is there for hours if not days in pain starving eventually dies or you come and dispatch it um and is um completely legal in, in any form if i'm right with with pole traps yeah and there are traps that can be which are legal traps that can be adapted to become pole traps so um some some of the ground sort of traps um can be moved or placed and then they effectively become the pole trap as it were so the actual trap itself might be a legal trap but then it's about where's the what's the scenario? Where's it been found? Um, where, where's it been placed? And, and what's the obvious kind of things? Yeah. So obviously that that um, bird of prey persecution is a really big hot topic at the moment. You think of things like hen harriers, um, enough good habitat for over 300 pairs uh, in the UK. Most years we get three, four, five breeding pairs, um, and it's thought that that is one of the main drivers for that is persecution, um, and and that's through through several means. Um, there's places out there will, that will tell you what to do if you happen across those sorts of traps because what people want to do is go and stick, a, stick in them, trigger them, take them away, throw them in a ditch, smash them up. Um, but then um, you're the person that then is committing a crime, if I'm, I'm right there, Rob. Um, ironically, a police car's just gone past me. <laughs> one of your lot. Um, is it one of mine? Good. Possibly. Right. Um, so, um, you're the person that's then breaking the law because you've you vandalised somebody else's property. So, but, but, right, that's where the scenario would be interesting in terms of, because what I've got to be careful what I'm drawing on here because I know this is obviously going to be recorded and held against me forever, but there we are. So uh, if, if we're talking, if we're, we're, we're confident that something is an illegal kind of setup, then when we talk about the sort of the, 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 the damaging of traps and stuff like that, the, 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 it, there is a bit of a minefield thing. What we suggest is that obviously, if you're coming across something that you feel like is a pole trap there, for instance, is illegal or whatever, we need to get that documented. It's, it's surrounding its, its, its location, um, photographs of it in situ, how it's been set up, um, bigger, wider photographs to be able to show exactly where the location is as well. Um, and obviously the what three words or grid reference or other apps are available as it were. Um, 
to be able to say exactly where it is. Now, it's a bizarre one, that, because, again, if, if you then move into the realms of, right, I'm going to disrupt, dismantle this trap, I'm going to whatever, put it away, actually, you're probably affecting uh, a, a chance of the prosecution of whoever's done that, because there are options open to us um, to be able to recover traps and do certain things. So it, what I'd say is if you, <laughs> we'd never advise that you go around dismantling art, but I get that there's a real sort of risk then if you then touch it or don't touch it, whatever like you might end up with the animal coming down within the minutes that you've then phoned it to the police and so on, uh, and the bird being subject to subject to injury or death. So it, it is a really tricky one. Um, and I'm sort of very mindful on, and I'm not going around sort of saying, well, you can do A, B, C, and D. Uh, I think very much so it would be a case of reporting it at that time, uh, being able to document the evidence. And, you know, with the control rooms, we can accept images emailed in. So if you're in that scenario, we can accept that evidence being emailed in to attach to an incident to say, this is what I've come across. Um, a, do you think it's legal? Is there someone that can have a look at it while I'm still stood here? Um, and then decisions can be made. What I'd say is, let's judge every case on its own merits rather than say, carte blanche, do A or B. Excellent. So some really good questions there, guys. Um, we're already 15 minutes over, so I'm going to bring this to a, to a hasty end. Um, Firstly, I want to thank um, everyone for attending. Uh, it's actually been really good to um, have people interested in wildlife crime and to educate themselves about what to look out for, how to report it, um, and how we can best work with the rural crime team um, to hopefully um, start to stamp out um, the illegal persecution of wildlife in Cheshire and beyond. Um, secondly, I want to thank Rob for, um, for giving up part of his evening to come in um, do this event for us. It's actually been really good um, for, for us as Wildlife Trust to, to be involved with you guys um, and learn a little bit more about um, some of the issues that our wildlife faces um, away from you know, conservation um, and population declines and to learn about the other um, issues that they have to deal with, um, hopefully on not too regular basis going forward. Um, talking of going forward, um, we will follow this up with a, an email that will have the link in to uh, a video of this webinar and we'll put in the extra um, videos about the what three words and how to report to suspect vehicle. Um, we'll also include in there the links to things like um, where you can find the wildlife um, laws um, on the government website and everything else that we've, we've mentioned through the video. Um, hopefully you've, you've really enjoyed um, this evening and we can put more feet on the ground, um, more eyes to the skies and hopefully really start to tackle um, some wildlife crime. Um, so there's nothing left for me to do to say um, stay safe, guys, and stay wild as well. And hopefully we'll see you at our future webinars as well. Okay, I'll see you soon. Have a nice evening.